be old. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us. We're glad you're here. We pray our service will be a blessing to you. It's the fourth Sunday in Lent in our service today. We're going to take a look at a familiar story, one I'm sure you'll remember from, from when you were in Sunday school. Uh, the Lord putting up the bronze snake. The people had to look to it in faith. We'll look at that and see an example of God's great love for us. Uh, you might notice we tried a little something different in the bulletin today. Uh, with everything printed in front, it's been suggested that maybe we don't need to have the scripture lessons printed out for us. Um, so we decided we'd try that. However, we do have some copies. If you like following along or like or want to be able to take them home, we've got some copies of the scripture lessons on the bulletin table. So we'll begin our service today with the singing of the first hymn.
will rise. We'll follow this morning the service of the word. If you'd like to follow in the hymnal, we're on page 38. Page 38. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Almighty God, we confess that we deserve to be punished for our evil deeds, but we ask you graciously to cleanse us from all sin and to comfort us with your salvation. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <clears throat> Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson today is written in the 12th chapter of the book of Isaiah. We start with the first verse. The Lord promises and, of course, he gives us forgiveness and salvation. And when, that, and when the Lord delivers us, uh, we have every reason to praise him. We see words of praise in these words this morning. In that day, you will say, I will praise you, O Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord for he has done gracious things let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. So far, our Old Testament lesson will continue by singing Psalm, it's a combination 42 and 43. If you'd like to follow in the hymnal, we are on page 82.
Our epistle lesson today is written in the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We start with the first verse. It's comforting to know God has done all and that it does not depend on our works. It all goes back to his grace, his undeserved love. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So far the epistle lesson, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. We'll rise for the gospel lesson. The Holy Gospel is written in the third chapter of St. John. We start with the 14th verse. Jesus is going back to our sermon text, applying it to himself. He's speaking and he says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the deserts, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen or seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. So far the gospel. Please be seated. We'll continue with the next hymn.
will rise. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. The words of God will consider on this the fourth Sunday of Lent are written in the 21st chapter of the book of Numbers. We start with verse 4. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. This is God's word. Please be seated. In the name of our gracious Lord, who loves us with an everlasting love, your children of God. You never make what I want. We never do what I want. You don't love me. Uh, the child was obviously unhappy. Um, Mom had made something for supper that he didn't like, and Mom was insisted, you eat what's on your plate, you eat what's set before you. And he was fumbling under his breath, you never make what I like. Well, he had forgotten that two days earlier, Mom had made his favorite supper, and that the day before that, Mom had made his favorite dessert. But that didn't seem to matter. All that mattered is that at that instant he had to do something he didn't like. Or the little girl, we never do what I want. Well, again, she had forgotten that earlier in the week the family had gone to a movie and they went to the movie that she wanted to see. And before that, they went to a restaurant that she chose so that they could eat what she wanted. And they had forgotten that the weekend before, or she had forgotten that the weekend before, mom and dad let her stay up extra late one night so that uh, they could play family games and then watch a movie. But again, at the time, that didn't seem to matter. All that mattered is that at this instant, she wasn't getting to do what she wanted to do. Hmm? You don't love me. Again, Children can uh, look at a situation and think only about that, that uh, maybe mom and dad aren't letting them do what they want to do, or mom and dad are making them do something they don't want to do, or maybe mom and dad are being firm with them, maybe even disciplining them, and all they can think about is, I don't like this, so you don't love me. Instead of thinking, boy, every day mom makes food for us to eat. Every morning she has breakfast for us. She has clean clothes for us to wear. How many times don't mom and dad take us places and do things for us? Uh, completely forgetting that, oh, dad skipped a meeting so that he could help her with her science project, or the times when mom sat up sometimes all night because you were sick and, and she was worried about you. See, the temptation is there to forget all the good things parents do or others do. The temptation is there to focus on the situation in front of us, what's going on, I don't like it, I'm unhappy, and then you give in, you grumble and complain and say some pretty foolish things. 
Well, that's basically what was happening here with the children of Israel. After almost 40 years of wandering in the desert, the children of Israel are finally getting ready to enter the promised land. Uh, to do that, they want to go through the country of Edom. And they send a message to the Edomites. We'd like to pass through. You know, we're not going to cause any trouble. You know, if we, if we drink water even, we'll pay you for it. Just let us pass through. And the Edomites, no, they were not willing. In fact, they came out with their army ready to go to war. So, instead of entering into the promised land, the children of Israel have to backtrack. And... They have to go back into the wilderness. And they're not really very happy about that. Instead of finally being done with wandering, they got to go back and wander some more. So, they grumble and complain, we're told. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. They don't like what's going on, so they lash out in anger. You just want us to die in the desert? Well, they had forgotten how great God's love is for them. For almost 40 years they had been wandering, and God had protected them. You go back and you think how he uh, delivered them from the Egyptians. Later on, when they're in the wilderness, the Amalekites attack them and God gives them victory. In fact, just before this, a Canaanite king named Arad had attacked and the Lord had given them victory. The Lord had preserved them. Uh, they had forgotten that, again, the 40 years were almost up and during that time, their clothes, their, shoothing, their, their sh clothing, their shoes, had not worn out. God had provided for them. There is no water. God had always provided. And how many times hadn't he done it miraculously? There's no bread. Well, God had provided food. Maybe they didn't like it. But every day, every day they saw a miracle firsthand. They'd get up, walk outside, and there was food right there for them. The manna. And, of course, the Lord had provided quail, too, so they could have meat. God had done all of this, again, throughout all those years in the wilderness. But right now, that didn't seem to be on their minds. It seemed like all they cared about was, we don't like this. And so they grumble against the Lord and against his servant who was their leader. So what does the Lord do? Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. Sounds pretty harsh. But the Lord has his purposes. In fact, even in this, we see how the Lord loved his people. We're told, the people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. Hmm? By sending this, God led them to repentance. And obviously, What's worse than suffering, suffering physical harm, even losing your earthly life? Worse would be to stay in a sin, lose your faith, and be lost forever. So in love, God did something to help their spiritual well-being. He sent these snakes, and it brought them to repentance. And then in love, the Lord did one more thing. We're told Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. See, the Lord provided a way for the people to be saved. Very simple and sure fire. Just look at the snake that was lifted up. That's all you have to do. But that, of course would require listening to the Lord and trusting him. A human reason might think, I'm, I'm bitten, I'm going to die. You want me to look? I mean, this makes no sense. 
but it was what God had said. It was the remedy God provided. And he provided it, again, even though they hadn't been trusting him before, right? And that's what it was, a lack of faith. The lack of trust that God would continue to guide them and that he would get them into the promised land in his time and in his way. And in spite of their lack of trust, in spite of their grumbling and complaining, the Lord loved them. He loved them, and so he brought them to repentance. He loved them, and so he provided a way for them to be saved. He did it all because he loved them. And the Israelites could look at all this, and they could see. They could see for themselves how great God's love was for them. And we can do the, the same thing. <clears throat> Does it ever happen that we're like the children of Israel here? It's easy for us sometimes to focus on one situation, something we don't like, something painful, and it's easy to forget, to not remember how great God's love is for us. I mean, to how many, what the Lord does for us day after day after day, just like he cared for the Israelites, he cares for us making sure that we have food to eat, that there's people who love us, providing so many luxuries. We live in this wonderful country where we enjoy more luxuries than anyone else in the history of time. And day after day, God provides for us and cares for us. Why didn't you have a car accident yesterday? Because the Lord was watching over you. Uh, why is it that you didn't die last month? Why was it you didn't die last year? Because the Lord was watching over you. All these blessings. And again, you think of what we get to enjoy. Uh, you type a few words in your computer, and they can be on the other side of the world to somebody in minutes. Or you punch in a few things on your phone, and you can communicate to somebody in seconds. Look at all that God has done for us. Now, in his wisdom... He might on occasion allow something to happen. We might get sick. We might have a, a car accident. Maybe he says no to a prayer, something we really wanted. Or maybe he takes something from us, or he doesn't allow us to have a certain kind of success. And the temptation is there to get upset and to get angry, to focus only on this situation at hand, it's not what I want. This is painful. This is unpleasant. I don't like this. And then, maybe question God's love. Wonder about his kindness and his goodness. Maybe even, like the Israelites, lash out in anger. And if we do, then we're guilty of sin just as they are. And God would have every right to be angry at us too, to take action against us to take away the blessings that we enjoy, to take away our lives, ultimately to punish us forever in hell. And yet, and yet God still loves us. And in his love, he still wants what's best for us. And what is best for us when we've fallen into a sin? That the Lord bring us to repentance. And there can be times when, like the Israelites, the Lord might allow something difficult, something painful to come into our lives in order to wake us up, to make us start thinking about something we're doing. Uh, he sent the, the venomous snakes to the Israelites. Uh, when you were little and you did wrong, and mom or dad maybe disciplined you, maybe you even got a spanking, it sent a message, right? It made you realize that what you were doing was wrong. And of course, the, the spanking was a deterrent. It made you think twice before you did it again, eh? And there's times the Lord can do that for us, too. Now, we want to be careful. We want to pray for wisdom. Just because, just because something troubling happens in your life, just because you're going through a time of hardship, just because something painful has come, that does not necessarily mean, it doesn't automatically mean that 
oh, I must have fallen into a sin, I better do something. Okay? There are times when the Lord tests us. He sends us troubles and hardships simply because in love, he wants to help us to grow. He wants to perhaps draw us closer to him. He wants to give us a chance perhaps to let our light shine for others, to be a witness for them. There can be all kinds of reasons why the Lord allows hardship and trouble to come to us. But it can happen. It can happen that on occasion, the Lord will send something troubling, something painful, as a way to wake us up, as a way to get us to start thinking a little bit more about what we're doing in our lives. An example. A man, go. Oh, well, he's enjoying life, things are going well for him, and he's so busy enjoying life that little by little he, th he thinks less and less about his relationship with God that uh, he skips church more and more and more often, uh, gets to the point where he's not saying his prayers anymore, more and more he's starting to drift away from the Lord. Something happens, maybe he gets sick, has an accident, he's afraid and all of a sudden he calls out, Lord help me, and all of a sudden he dawns on him. When's the last time I prayed? When's the last time I was in church? And so the Lord uses the trouble to wake him up and to get him to realize he needs to start thinking harder about the way that he's living his life. Or it can happen. A man, oh, getting a little older and starting to grumble a little bit about his wife. She doesn't look the way she did when she was 22. She's getting older and... Oh, she has some issues with her health. Uh, it's not so easy sometimes to be dealing with her. And inside, he's grumbling, he's complaining, he's even secretly wondering about what kind of marriage this is. And then his wife gets sick, and all of a sudden it dawns on him, I could lose her. And the sickness wakes him up and it makes him realize, ah, I better think twice about this person that God has, has given to me. See, and those are just a couple of examples. And again, we want to emphasize, just because something bad has happened to you or someone you care about, that does not automatically mean that God is trying to get you to, to repent of some sin. Again, as we said, there can be other reasons. He wants to test you. He wants you to grow. He wants to draw you closer to him. He wants you to grow in wisdom. He wants you to cling more, prom or more firmly to his promises. He wants you to pray harder. Or again, he wants you to let your light shine. There could be all kinds of reasons. But it can happen that something happens and all of a sudden it wakes you up and you realize, ah, I better be thinking about my life. Maybe it, it shocks you and brings to your face the fact that, you know, I have been doing this. Or I have been letting my relationship with God slide. I have been getting a little careless. He, he wakes you up, and he does lead you to see something and bring you to repentance. And even in then, we, re, we see and we remember just how great God's love is for us. And when we fall when, whenever we, we realize we've sinned, God does something else extraordinary for us, right? Remember what Jesus said about this. He said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Remember how great God's love is for you. That even when we mess up, even when we make mistakes, he loves us. He leads us to see our sins, and then what does he tell us? He sent his son who took care of everything. The punishment we should suffer was put on Jesus. God is not going to treat us as our sins deserve because Jesus has already dealt with them 
you are forgiven. So be sure that no matter what, God loves you. And again, that's a wonderful comfort. Again, when God allows a time of testing to come or he allows us to go through some hardship, even if he does something to make us realize our sin, we still have that comfort. God already punished Jesus, so he's not punishing me. Even this is not God punishing me. Even this is not God getting me because he's angry at me. Even this is God loving me because he wants to draw me close to him. He wants me to be blessed. He wants to make sure that I will always stay his dear child and always trust in Jesus as my Savior so that I will be in heaven one day. And you think about all of that, and you realize what a wonderful God we have. And if we ever struggle, if we ever doubt, and like the children of Israel, we might be tempted to do that. We might not like what's going on right before us. And if we ever wonder, and we can think back of all he does, of what we have, in the gift of his son, looking up in faith to the one on the cross, remember what it does, what it means, what we have. We are God's children. God loves you. You are going to live forever, all because of what he's done for us through his son. And we marvel, wow, just how great is God's love for us. Amen. And we'll rise. <clears throat> And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And we'll join in confessing our Christian faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> if you'd like to follow with us in the hymnal, we're on page 41. The Apostles' Creed, we read, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with the offering. As we gather the offering, we'll sing this, the hymn, His Cross, My Life. Again, a reminder, there's a brief introduction and a brief interlude between each verse.
We'll rise. And we'll continue with the response of prayer for the church. If you'd like to follow in the hymnal, we're on page 42. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. We offer three special prayers this morning, Lord. First of all, for Norma Fredrickson, who continues to struggle after suffering a stroke. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to watch over her. Please give her strength to endure this time of suffering. Let your spirit be strong in her, Lord. If it's your will, help her to make improvements. Through it all, please, Lord, be working in her mind and her heart to know that you are with her and that you will help her through this and that you will always love her and care for her. We also offer a special prayer, Lord, for Eric Schultz, who is now in hospice care. We ask, Lord, that you would be with Eric. Please strengthen his faith. Give him, give him strength to endure the, the final days or weeks of his life. Help him to know, Lord, that those who believe in you will never die, but will be with you in glory. Please keep his faith strong and give strength and comfort to his family and loved ones as well. Finally, Lord, we also offer a special prayer for Aaron Jenstead, who is hospitalized in Florida and is in very serious condition. We ask, Lord, that you would use your almighty power to grant healing to him. Please, Lord, restore him to health. Please give wisdom to the doctors and the nurses, all the staff, so that they know just what to do to help him so that he can improve. Please, Lord, work in his heart and keep his faith strong. Help him to know that even in this, you are with him, you will strengthen him, that you will see him through and work for his good. Please, Lord, grant your extra special blessing to all his family and loved ones who are concerned about him as well. Give them that strength and that comfort that you alone can give. Hear us now, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, and our ministries and offerings. Use them to your glory. <laughs> you, hear us now as we pray the prayer your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with the next hymn. This is one that may not be familiar to many of you. We heard the soloist sing it uh, shortly before church, and we're going to ask the pianist to play it through once before we start singing. We'll rise. We'll pray, and in this prayer, we'll also ask the Lord for his blessing upon our voters' meeting this morning. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering with our fellow Christians this morning to hear your word. We ask that you would send the Holy Spirit into our hearts, Lord, so that we will cling to your promises. Help us to realize how great your love is for us. Help us to remember, Lord, that even in times of testing, even when you send hardship or painful troubles to us, even in this you are loving us to bring us blessings that you know are best for us. Help us, Lord, in faith always to look to your Son as our Savior so that we might be your children and have eternal life with you in heaven. We ask, Lord, that you would bless our voters' meeting this morning. Grant wisdom to the voters. Help them to work together in a spirit of love and true co cooperation. Lead us to the decisions that will truly honor you and enable us to do your, your work in the best possible way. Should we make the decision to extend a call this morning, lead us, Lord, to the person that you know is truly best for us, who will truly serve us and be a blessing to our congregation and school in the best possible way. Please, Lord, be with us as we prepare to leave this house of worship. Keep us safe in your care, and if it's your will, allow us to worship together again. We pray this to you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor 
and give you peace. We'll stay standing for the final hymn verse. seated everyone. Good morning once again. Thank you for being with us. A special welcome to those who are visitors here with us today. We pray God's word you heard would be a blessing for your life. Please sign our guest book and if you'd like we'll give you a visitor packet that'll give you more information about our church. Uh, we've got a number of things we want to announce to you. We'll try to do that quickly. Uh, first of all, again as we noted, We'll have a special voters meeting this morning. We'll take a little bit of time to relax, mingle, and then we'll meet. Uh, hopefully we can be, be going here in, in not too much time, uh, hopefully before 1015. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be having bingo for the seniors. And I'm told that uh, seniors, anyone over 55, consider yourself invited. Uh, should be a lot of fun. They're going to have snacks, homemade ice cream, and some prizes. So hopefully you can join us for that. Uh, going on through the week, um, again, no Jesus Cares tomorrow because, uh, of course, Aaron is ill. Uh, for those of you who might wonder, um, he has a severe case of pneumonia, so severe that it's causing him extremely intense pain. Uh, also, the, there's an infection so bad that his kidneys are starting to function less and less. So this is something extremely, extremely serious. So please, uh, say some extra prayers that God would would grant him healing and take care of him. Going through the week, DUE and Council meeting this week, our next midweek Lenten service on Wednesday, our fellowship meal, and then choir. Um, Easter lilies, we're not too far from Easter. If you'd like to sign up and donate one, you can do that. Uh, the end of the week, the, the Beagler benefit on the 28th, uh, you can read about that. If you'd like to donate something to help with that, you can certainly do that. There's a note on page 7 about the play at Great Plains. On the 27th, the Night of Music, uh, two sides here. If you have a, uh, a talent, if you sing or would like to play an instrument, talk to me. We'll, we'll put you on the schedule. You can have the chance to perform. On the other hand, uh, please come and join, and, uh, and join us and see some of the talent that God has given to our people. And I know a lot of the piano students will be playing as well, so if you'd like to hear the children, uh, they'll, be, they'll be performing that night. You can note Kindergarten Roundup and Easter for Kids. There's a sign-up for children and a sign-up for helpers. Week from today, we'd like to pass out flyers inviting, again, people to Easter for Kids, Holy Week services, and to advertise our preschool. So we'll go for about an hour. If you can join us, that would be great here at 2 o'clock. Um, I think maybe just one other thing. It's been said that with... The whole service printed in the front. Maybe we don't need to have so much things in the bulletin. We can cut down on paper. So we experimented. Um, again, we, we did have lessons printed out on some sheets if you'd like. If you think this is good, tell us. If you think this is not good, please tell us. Uh, again, the whole purpose is to try to get the bulletin so that it can help you in the best possible way with worship and with information about what's going on at church. Those are the announcements, everyone. Thank you. And good morning.